Thank you very much. So still, uh, this um, competition goes on. Um, so, um, talking about the plan, I mentioned some plan I'm not going to repeat. Uh, the titles uh, we did uh, one, we are finishing uh, two, so let's say like, um, like this, half of that. Uh, we will uh, then today finish two, I hope, and then go to four, and then for, uh, for tomorrow we have um, some sort of um, time sharing, more or less half of three and half for five. Uh, with respect to two tutorials we have, uh, today's tutorial, I just remind you once again that we have tutorial at uh, 4.30 today by Katarina Kukic, is going to be related with uh, this part and the tutorial we have on Friday by Anani and Edward is going to be connected with this part. So uh, three and five will get less attention within the course, but they will uh, get uh, much more attention uh, on tutorials. So this is a, so two was um, cubics and elliptic functions. And we are almost, uh, Presented that in a sense that you, I think, remember uh, the main message fr from the last, uh, last part, that in a sense we have, a, that we have a, two pictures, we have a two pictures. One is uh, related with non-singular cubic, so here is a, cubic, and here are, um, here is a torus, I say like this, which we obtained uh, considering the fundamental uh, parallelogram for uh, two periodic functions with period omega 1 and omega 2. This was Last time it was denoted by omega 2, that was denoted by omega 1. And we have two, two structures here on a cubic curve. This structure has been presented in the following way. So this is a, a circle B, and then this involution gives us A plus B. Um, you remember that for a given A, there was also involution this tau. Which map A to minus a in this structure. And here we have just uh, fundamental addition of uh, vectors in a, if you want, in a R2 or complex numbers in C, calculated mo modulo the lattice generated by omega 1 and omega 2. And then we constructed here very important elliptic function of uh, order two. So this is a Weierstrass uh, P function. And we show that uh, if you use uh, that Weierstrass P function satisfies a very important uh, differential equation.
which uh, allow us to construct uh, this map from this picture to that, denoting this as a polynomial of degree three in P function, we have a map. The map is, so map phi from torus to, let's say, gamma. mapping z to p of z, p prime of z1. I mean, this is okay that this formula goes across this, uh, this line because this is a map from this window to that one. And then uh, the final statement was that this map is not only a bijection, it is an isomorphism of groups isomorphism of groups. So in a sense, for example, if we have three, three points here, in this picture, if we have three points, let's say uh, uh, U, V, and uh, W, such that U plus V plus W is zero, then we know that this map would map these three points here into what? So you see, this is A plus B. That means that A circle B is tau of A plus B. That means this is minus of A plus B. So A, B, and minus A plus B are collinear. So three points here are collinear if and only if its sum is zero. That means that three points here are mapped here in collinear points. And we, we are now going to use this very simple thing. But just before that, let me make a few very simple remarks, but important. So of course, here we are getting a polynomial of a specific form. Here we are getting polynomial of a specific form. It, it, con it doesn't contain uh, terms with the quadratic, uh, quadratic terms, but of course, with the appropriate change of coordinates, we can always reduce a general polynomial of degree three to, to that form. Maybe I can leave using this uh, uh, good, uh, good uh, example of uh, Sergei some, some exercises. So, so uh, talking about this, this um, immediately we have an exercise to prove. So what was exercised last time was that um, we have these uh, midpoints here, omega 1, omega 2, and omega 1 plus omega 2. And here, if we denote these points E1, E2, E3, then uh, if you remember exercise from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the last time, we, uh, we said that uh, P prime is 0 in these three points. So from the last time, we have that P prime of, for example, omega i is equal P prime of omega 1 plus omega 2 is 0. So that means that at this point, this is going to be 0. That means that P of W1, P of W2, and P of W1 plus W2 are going to give us E1, E2, and E3. So E1 is, for example, P of W1, E2 is P of W2, and E3 is, for example, P of W1 plus W2. Exercise is to prove that these three points obtained in this way are distinct. So prove that E1 is not equal 
E2 is not equal, E3 is not equal, E1. So this is one exercise. Another uh, uh, remark, of course here there is some sort of choice because we can denote uh, P of omega 1 to be E2, P of omega 2 to be E3, and for example, uh, to use some permutation of this. And of course, uh, we cannot expect from an elliptic curve to know what was our choice. Uh, so the question is when uh, two elliptic curves are um, in a sense, are isomorphic. So when can we, in a sense, identify two elliptic curves? And the answer is uh, given in terms, so we have this, you remember the, the picture of last time, so we have E1, E2, E3, and P infinity as the four points where we made these cuts and then we glued these two planes or two CP ones together, ramified over these four points. So, we have four significant points which correspond uh, to, the, to those points which uh, satisfy that uh, of order that two times this point is, is zero. And for four points, let's say E1, E2, E3, and P infinity in our last notation, what we can do as follows from the instructions obtained in, in, in Sergei's lectures, is that having four points, we can calculate their cross ratio. So we have a cross ratio of these four points. And as Sergei observed, cross ratio of four points is not uniquely determined. It depends on this uh, choice of order. So we can get numbers like, I, I make mistake, but you will. Uh, lambda 1 minus lambda, uh, what else? 1 over lambda, uh, 1 over 1 minus lambda, um, and lambda over lambda minus 1, and lambda minus 1 over lambda. I think this 6, six typically you can get. And then we can say that, I mean, th this is a theorem, two elliptic curves are uh, isomorphic if this uh, set of six values coincide for these two for these two elliptic curves. Of course, there are some specific elliptic curves where you don't have six different values. But this is, in a sense, the additional, additional, additional story. So, what I want to say is that uh, uh, we should, uh, in a sense, start um, accepting a principle that whenever you have something which is a, a double cover of, over CP1 with four branching points, it's an elliptic curve. So this is, in a sense, uh, uh, gu guiding uh, informal principle. This principle, of course, can be can be uh, formalized by uh, Riemann uh, Hurwitz formula. Which says if you have a holomorphic map Uh, between two compact Riemann surfaces, then the Euler characteristic of origin is equal degree of F times Euler characteristic of image minus something which we call um, degree of ramification. So this is a general general story. So what, what it is about, so we have something, let's say gamma somehow mapped to gamma prime. Here is gamma, here is gamma prime. A general fiber, if 
if you take here uh, some general point and consider inverse image, general this fiber has some fixed number of n points. This n is called degree of a map. This is the degree of a map. In our case, it's two. But it could happen that there are some points where you don't have so many points in pre-image like here, and you have some gluing, and this R ramification divisor in a sense counts this number of points where you have this sort of effect, and degree of this R is a total count of this sort of collapses of numbers of free images above some points. So in our case, in our case, um, since uh, G prime is um, G prime is CP one is of uh, genus zero. This is the elliptic curve of genus one. This degree is two, and this uh, degree of R, since we have four uh, points where we have this uh, uh, ramification, this is four. So in our case, in our case is, is uh, so we have uh, two minus two times one equal two times two times two times zero minus four. So as you can see. This identity is co correct. So this is a verification of this principle that whenever you have something uh, uh, double ramified, uh, double, uh, uh, some double cover o over CP1 ramified at four points, this is an elliptic curve. OK. So now let's, as a sort of an example, as sort of example, use this. Uh, in a sense, if you want to fully appreciate what we, what we derived, we need somehow to apply this. So uh, the, the, the one way how we can apply, we can use this uh, fact that having three points in this picture with the sum zero uh, means that in, in this image, they're going to collinear points. This uh, information is enough to derive a very nice classical formula, addition formula for Weierstrass p function. So let me just, as a sort of example, so example, this is addition formula. P function. So, if I may uh, allow a, a small remark, I see that all of us are a little bit today, uh, in a sense, out of shape. I don't know if you had some some uh, interesting uh, nights watching football or so. So, please um, uh, try to follow because I can easily make now mistake in the calculations on the board. I need your full attention in order to, to, to prevent some uh, crea creation of a new unknown formula. So, so please, uh, let's try to do it together. It's a, it's a simple exercise, but still it requires some sort of concentration. So we have uh, three points, u, v. We have three points, u, v, and w is nothing but minus u plus v. So that means that. Uh, uh, take u and v and map here, you will get some that these two points determine some line, and then that means that um, the a point obtained as a map of minus u plus v belong to that line. So suppose I will now that the formula for, for that line is something like. Um, OK, so let me, something like this. It's so a P prime of Z minus some A P of Z minus B equals 0 is satisfied for Z equal U, is satisfied for Z equal, for Z equal U, V, and minus U plus V. So when we plug these three concrete values, 
then these three uh, points belong to the same line here determined by coefficients 1 minus a minus b. On the other hand, we know that these three uh, points are also situated on the curve. They belong to this cubic curve. So that means that, um, let me just write this, p prime of z square is equal, this is polynomial there. So this is a 4 times p cube z minus g2 p z minus g3. And again, if you plug these three values here, we are getting, um, we are getting, um, this is also satisfied. Uh, so, um, so the, the, the system is satisfied in these three points. So fr from this relation, I can exclude p prime, and I can write here a p plus b square equal this 4 p cube minus g2 p minus g3. So now we need to calculate something. So this is a, so let's uh, now try to, to rewrite everything in a, just as a polynomial. So u, v, and minus u plus v are going to be arguments of p function which satisfy the following polynomial, polynomial equation. So the equation is 4 z cube minus a square z square minus g2 plus 2ab. I hope it's correct. z minus g3 minus b square equals 0. So this is a polynomial in z for which we know that it has three zeros. We know three zeros. z1 equal p of u, z2 equal p of v, and z3 equal uh, p of minus uh, u minus v, but we know that p is even function, we can use it or not use it, never mind. So it's a p of u plus v. So we know three zeros of this polynomial of degree three. So what would you suggest me to do now? What would you suggest me to do? See, we have a polynomial and we know it's, I mean we know, we know it's uh, three zeros. What we really want to do is we want to express this zero in terms of these two. This is our ultimate goal. To get additional f a formula means to express uh, p of u plus v in terms of values in u in, and v. And um, this is our all the time the same dilemma. What to erase. So tell me, what do you suggest me to do? If we have a polynomial and we know three zeros, we can use what is the proper English term for this? Vieta formulas. Eh? Vieta, I think this is in English. Vieta, probably uh, uh, borrowed from Italian. I don't know why it should be in English. Vieta, but okay, it's a Vieta formula. Saying that what? The sum of zeros is equal what? a squared over 4. 
sum of zeros, so p of u plus p of v plus p of u plus v is equal a squared over 4. We are almost done. We are almost done, but not yet. We need to calculate somehow a from here, knowing that um, it, this is satisfied for u and v. So we plug now here u and v, and we are getting two equations from where we can calculate a in terms of p of u, p prime of u, p of v, p prime of v. So what is a? What is a? Let's calculate. What is a from here? Uh, a is, how can we get? A is, from here, A is something like P prime of V minus P prime of U divided by P of V minus P of U. This is A. And finally, we are getting the formula that we want to express, this is our goal, to express P of U plus V minus P of U minus P of V uh, plus uh, two times P of V minus P of U P prime of V minus P prime of U square. So this is the formula. So please uh, remember this formula, if time permits, in section five we will use it once. So that's why we need it, because we are going to, if not use, at least mention. So this is addition formula for Weierstrass function. We are getting it as a simple consequence of this, of this um, uh, situation. Okay, and let me uh, say um, just a few more, um, just s some remarks, since we are here, regarding um, a situation uh, of um, multi dimensional uh, billiards. So for billiards uh, and uh, Poncelet uh, theorem, we will see billiards in the in, within ellipse. And for uh, Poncelet theorem in the plane, we will see uh, today or uh, tomorrow that it is uh, really related to this addition structure on, on a cubic. Uh, for higher dimensional uh, situation, for uh, billiards within, within quadrics in dimension D, it appears that relevant, uh, relevant uh, objects are hyperelliptic curves. So here in dimension D equal 2, so what we had here, in dimension D equal 2, the relevant was genus G equal 1. This is elliptic curve in D equal D it appears that the relevant object is going to be hyperelliptic curve of genus equal d minus 1. So hyperelliptic curve uh, in similar fashion as uh, elliptic curve can be defined by its equation of, of the form y squared equal p 2 g plus 1 of x, where P is a polynomial of degree 2, 2g plus 1. Or, this is also true for, for elliptic curves, you can go to even dimensional and then here put P of 2g plus 2, as we could have here also uh, tell the story with the case of polynomials of degree 4. It just depends on this. So here we have degree 3 because one of these four important points is chosen to be at infinity. Of course, in a sense, there is a 
subtle difference talking about elliptic curves of presentation in this way and that way, because in presentation in this way, somehow this point at infinity is, in a sense, significant. This significance is lost here because here, in a sense, all these four points are equally, equally good. But let me come back to this case of, of um, hyperelliptic curves of genus of, of, of any genus. So, so the point is that the genus is, of course, immediately bigger than one. So in that case, what I want to say is that still the, uh, the, there are, in a sense, uh, there exist, there are these two screens. One screen here is a curve itself of genus, uh, of genus G, so curve of genus G, just schematically we can think about something like this. So here is a genus 3. And here, in this case, object is, some, here, here it, it, it was a torus, and, and in the case of uh, curves of higher genus is torus of higher dimension. So what is at the same time nice, significant, and uh, uh, in a sense uh, transparent in the case of elliptic curves, this is at the same time misleading in the case of elliptic curves. So in the case of elliptic curves, we have two pictures of objects which are isomorphic. So we have here a curve, here we have torus, and Double's theorem says the torus is isomorphic to the curve. In higher uh, general situation, here we have curves, which are not torus anymore, not tori anymore, but there exist some very important objects, some higher dimensional tori, which play the role this torus here played here. It's just a sort of a framework to understand that there is a sort of a higher, higher general uh, uh, generalization which is going to be relevant for higher dimensional billiards. Okay, uh, having said that, let me also mention a few, few uh, general important uh, the, uh, theorems, and I will uh, formulate them for the case of elliptic curves, and we are going to, this way or another, use. Uh, so when we are talking about complex algebraic curves and uh, elliptic and uh, hyperelliptic curves are examples, then uh, there are two main, I would say, two main classical questions. Two, I would say, important. So uh, suppose you have some uh, two uh, collections of points, let's say P1, Pn, and this is one and another Q1, Qn. These points belong to the curve. You can also assume that some of these points have a multiplicity, and that's why they use a sort of a fancy name for this or called divisor, just a formal sum, where you can put some coefficients here if you want, and here Q1. But here there is no actual addition. This is just a way of saying that we are taking these points with maybe some multiplicity. And then the question could be given, for example, these two uh, collections of points, is there a meromorphic function on gamma having these points as zeros and these points as poles? 
This is one classical question. And another classical question is, so the existence of a function such that this is the notation. Divisor of function means uh, zeros minus poles is P1 plus Pn minus, this is just notation. So the existence of a such a function. And the second question is, so this is the first, and the second question is, if you provide a sort of a, a set of points with some possible uh, multiplications, the question is, uh, what is the dimension of the space of functions uh, uh, having poles not worse than those prescribed here? So if I denote this by D, then we can say that L of D is a space of functions, metamorphic functions, such that these functions don't have poles worse than those described by D. This notation here uh, is for the following. So if we have some D1, which is some combination of N1, P1, plus n k p k, where p i are points on gamma and n i are um, integers, then we say that d1 is effective, d1 is, this is the notation and the name is effective, if all n i are uh, non-negative. So the answer so the first question is given by so-called Abel's theorem. Again, Abel's theorem. Uh, and I will formulate this for elliptic functions. So Abel's theorem for elliptic curves. So uh, the answer is as simple as, as this. So you have this n, n points, uh, one set of n points, and another set of n points. This plus here is just formal notation. But the Abel theorem says, since this function, in the case of uh, elliptic curve, which is group, belong to a group, then Treat this as a real summation. Do summation in the terms of the group. So calculate, so having given P1, Pn, and Q1, Qn, then do real summation in the group, P1 plus, let me do like this, plus Pn, where here I uh, elliptic curve, so gamma plus, I want to indicate that here this is a real addition as described here and here. So sum these n points as n elements in the group, sum these n points as elements in the group, and if this is equal in that group, which means in this picture means uh, equal as a sum of complex number up to the lattice, and in this picture means what means here. So if and only if this is satisfied, then there exists a function such that is this P, P1 plus Pn minus Q1 plus Qn. So it gives, in a sense, very... So here this plus is just a formal notation saying we are taking these points, and here the plus is real uh, summation in this group structure. So this is a, this is a Abel's theorem, and this uh, theorem measuring um, the dimension of this space is known as a Riemann-Roch theorem. <laughs> 
it says that um, um, uh, okay for, for the case of um, elliptic a curve it says that dimension of this space is equal I will explain now degree of D so where degree of degree of um, so I will explain here degree of D1 is sum of these numbers sum of n i. So sum of these coefficients. This is the degree. So this is for g equal 1. For g equal 1, for g greater than 1 is a little bit more delicate. Uh, for, so for any g, I can easily write the following. The dimension of L of d is greater or equal degree of d minus g plus 1, this I can easily say. And I can say that, for example, equality is for sure. So divisors d, for which uh, here is equality, are called non-special. And then, for example, if, if degree of d is greater or equal d 2g minus 1, then d is for sure non-special. OK. I'm just uh, mentioning this because it can have some relevance in higher dimensional billiards. But for us, actually, this is what is important. So the dimension of this space, dimension of this space in G equal 1 depends only on pure arithmetics. How many, how big this divisor is, how many, what is the degree, this is the dimension of the space. It doesn't depend on geometry of this. These points can be, can be uh, scattered arbitrary. There is no geometric component in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, formula, however, in higher in higher uh, genera, it can be important where what is the, the geometric position of these points because sometimes having divisor of the same degree, it can be special or non-special. So here can be some some uh, difference in this formulation that for arbitrary uh, g dimension is greater or equal this expression here. This is a let me just mention this for, for reference. This is a, a Riemann inequality. OK. But in a sense, um, we are safe here So because we know uh, from, from here, we know many gradients how to construct um, elliptic functions. So maybe uh, I can give, again, some exercise. Um, this is a, suppose you have um, exercise. Suppose you have. Um, you need to have at least uh, d divisors of degree 2. So suppose you have um, four points. On an elliptic curve. And suppose that a1 plus a2 is equal. Oh, I, I can maybe say b1, b2, b1 b2 is equal b1 plus b2. So construct a function f 
such that divisor of f is a1 plus a2 minus b1 plus b2. So you need to play with Weierstrass function and somehow to, as, so Weierstrass function provides you uh, Lego, Le, Lego cubes and you need somehow with these Lego cubes to, to construct a function satisfying, satisfying this. Okay, now uh, let us uh, answer uh, one more um, question one more question and then we we can go to to uh, direct and then we can go directly to to Poncelet, Poncelet theorem so this is the question how to the so given uh, cubic given elliptic curve this way or that way uh, our uh, goal is to describe points uh, which satisfy the condition that so the, the, the points which satisfy the condition that, now I need to think just what I need to, to uh, I don't want to erase now what I need later, so le let me think. Um, so definitely exercises I don't need. So this, tans no exercise. No exercise. Mm. We are not going to talk about higher genera anymore. Plane we don't need. Mm. Okay, now we will see if what's going to happen in five minutes. So, the question now we are interested in is um, question, so in, in that uh, group structure, we are interesting, to, uh, we want to describe points such that n p equal zero. So you sum several times point with itself and um, you end up at zero. These points are some uh, times called division points. Points. So can we here see these division points? For example, if n is equal to, if n is equal to, where are these division points for n equal to? At least I haven't erased this, this uh, picture. So where are these points for n equal to? Do you see them? The answer is they are there. They're presented on the board. This is omega 1 small omega 1, small omega 2, and small omega 1 plus omega 2. They're already there. OK. Um, the, uh, so this is a two, two p, So this is the solution of 2p equals 0. 3p equals 0, solutions of this, we will call them flex, flexes. So the solutions are flex. Can we see these here, those where 3p equals 0? So for 2p 
equals zero, uh, we need to have here half, half, and then to sum. So for three p, what we need to do? What? We need to take, I think, what? One seventh or what? One third. Okay, one third, two thirds, one third, two thirds, and then to produce these points. This is how we can catch these points here. But what we want to do is we want to somehow um, uh, de uh, determine some analytic condition in terms of this equation here, y squared equal polynomial of degree 3 in x. So this is what we need to, 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 to derive. So suppose that uh, n p equals 0, what it means is that we can say n p is equal n 0. And 0 is, in that presentation there, is this point at infinity. This is this point at infinity. So we see that n p should be equal n times p at infinity. And this equality means sum this in a group, sum this in a group, and this should be equal. So if this is satisfied, then by Abel's theorem, by Abel's theorem, that, mean, that means there exists a meromorphic function having this, uh, having pole of order n at p infinity and having 0 at p of order n. So by Abel's theorem, that means there exists F in L of n p infinity such that uh, F of p is 0 of order n. This is, trans trans uh, this is translation of our problem using Abel's theorem. So we see that the important space is this one, L of n p infinity. So this is the space of functions having pole at 0 of order not more than n. This is space of functions. This is a space of functions having, so this is a space of functions, meromorphic functions, having pole only at 0 of order not bigger than n. What is the dimension of this space? What is the dimension of this space? What is the dimension of this space? So by riemann uh, roch uh, formula, this is degree of this divisor, and this is, so this is degree of n p infinity, and this is n. This is n. So take a so take a basis, take a basis f1, fn, a basis in L n p infinity. And then we, we, we can even derive a little bit more than, than what we need. So suppose, suppose that in, instead of uh, looking for one point p such that n p equal 0, we can consider even more general. We are looking to, sec, to, to check if for given n different or some equal points is p1 plus p n equals 0. So take these points. And so what we want, 
to 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 so if p1 plus plus pn equals zero, that means that there exists a function f in L of n p infinity such that f of p i is zero for i going from one to n. But if f is in this space, that means that there exist c1 cn constants such that f is equal c1 f1 plus plus cn fn. Because if this is a element of the space, it is expressed by the elements of the basis. And we know, so these are constants. When we evaluate this at p1 to pn, we're getting 0. So we're getting a system of equations. We're getting a system of equations. This is known basis. And we evaluate in a known points. So we are getting a system on unknown coefficients. So what we are getting, we are getting a system um, what is the system? C1 F1 of P1 plus plus Cn Fn of Pn of P1 is 0. C1 of F1 of P2 plus Cn of Fn of P2 is 0. So on. C1 of F1 of Pn plus Cn of Fn of Pn is 0. This is what we are getting. So in order for such a system to have a non-trivial solution in C1 to Cn, we need to, the condition is that this determinant calculated at P1, Pn of F1 of P1 uh, let me see, f1 of p1, so c1, so what should, 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 what should go here, f, what should they put here, f, uh, what, what, come on, what is here, f, what, f, f2 of p1, very good, let's see, f, n of p1, now it's easy, fn of p1, now it goes f, f1 is easy, but I made a mistake, f1 of p2, f2 of p2, fn of p2, uh, f1 pn, f2 pn, fn pn, should be equal to 0. This is the condition. So uh, now, this is a, so we answer the general question. So if these points P1 to Pn are go, going uh, to, to coincide, we are getting a limit case. And for limit case, We are getting a Vronskian, uh, just to, to make it a little bit uh, quicker, is F1, Fn, F1 prime, Fn prime. Here is F1, n minus 1, Fn, n minus 1, calculated at that point P should be equal to 0. So the condition that n times P is equal to 0, P is division point 
if and only if this, this determinant is zero. This is the condition. Now, we can uh, still use this um, picture we have had here because we can provide an explicit basis using this morphism we, we, we had here. So how can we provide this basis? So there are two. Now we need to um, we need to I'm just thinking if I can erase now this Abel's theorem. Uh, suppose I can. I need some space. So, just for some uh, small technical uh, reasons, we should now distinguish two cases when n is even and n is odd. So, suppose, so first case, first case if n is odd, if n is odd, I want to. Uh, give you a specific basis, or I want to ask you to give me a specific basis. So what we know, here is, here is this map. Here is this map, still here. So you see, p function goes to x. So this is our x on the cubic side. This is our y of a cubic side. So x is nothing but p function, and p function is of order, what was the pole of p function? 2. So x is of order 2, and y is of order 3. We don't have anything of order 1. We have x of order 2, and we have y of order 3, and we know that y square is equal polynomial of degree 3 of x. So if you know that x is of order 2 and y is of order 3, how can we provide the basis of this, of this space, which should be? So we need to have 2m plus 1 function satisfying the condition that order at 0 is not bigger than this. So first, what? Any ideas? Constant functions. Then x is of order 2. Then what? We can go with x to, so this is order 2. So if you put here m, we are still good. Because this is of order 2m, and this is 2m plus 1. But we cannot go further with x. Now we can put y. This is of order 3. We can put yx. This is of order 5. And we can go on until here we need to be precise. y times x of something. What? This is where I need your help. So what I can put here? So y is 3. 2m plus 1 minus 3 is 2m minus 2. So we can put here, what? m minus 1. And now, uh, first of all, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, m plus 1, m, 2m plus 1. We already have 2m plus m, uh, 2m plus uh, 1. We already have. So we don't need to go further. So this is the basis. You, uh, we could have, for example, go y square. But y square is already a function of x. So it cannot give us anything new. OK. So that means that uh, um, we need to produce this sort of calculation, we need to produce 
this sort of cal cal calculation for these particular functions. And this is differentiation with respect to x. So this is a differentiation with respect to x. And the good thing with this uh, a differentiation with respect to x is that differentiating x on n with respect to x, uh, k times is easy. So lemma d over dx j times of x of k, and we are doing this at 0, even better, is what? Is almost always 0, and it is what? What? What, what? We, we, we evaluate it here now at 0, only at 0. It can be equal k. So it, it is 0 if j is not equal k. And if it is j equal k, it's what? k factorial. OK. Or j factorial, if j equal k. That's true. So it's good. It's good. OK. By the way, and what is the, now you can tell me for n equal 2m, just for a reference. What is the basis for n equal 2m? What is the basis for n equal to m? It's 1 x x m y y x on what? Uh, what should be there? m minus 1. m minus 1. Uh, is it m minus uh, m? Um, Sorry, m minus 2, huh? m minus 2 here. OK. So this is the basis in this case. OK. And now we need to calculate this. There is no, uh, we need to do some calculation. I mean, there is a, some tedious calculation. Thanks to this lemma, thanks to this lemma, I'm now just referring to the first case. This uh, can be, Seen that so here we have a, here we have b, here we have uh, zero, and here we have some c, where a, uh, due to this uh, uh, lemma, a is one one two factorial m factorial. So this is m plus one times m plus one. So it's a di diagonal matrix. It is a diagonal matrix, which means that what is the consequence of the fact that this matrix is diagonal? The consequence, we are looking for the condition determinant equals 0. And this is a diagonal matrix with this uh, positive coefficient. So that means. You see, now we have to be very happy. Because that means we don't care about B. We don't care about B. We only care about C. And of course, C includes these now derivatives of Y. So if we suppose that, so Y square equal polynomial of degree 3 of X, and now Y is square root of polynomial of degree of 3 of x. If we uh, expand this in Taylor expansion, plus uh, so on, um, then one can check, and as Sergei uh, say, um, this is an implicit exercise, that uh, C is uh, of this form. 
Okay, I will, I will, there are some really here uh, coefficients which are not so important, but let me write correct formula. So, and since we are talking about the condition, so m plus 1 factorial is a coefficient of the whole column, m plus 2 factorial, and so on. So since we are looking for the condition when this uh, determinant equals 0, we can forget about these um, uh, coefficients, and we can rewrite, finally, our answer in the form We can rewrite our answer in the form okay for n equal two m plus one. The answer is, and uh, so, forget about these coefficients. Forget about these coefficients. We don't need them. Then we are getting a very specific, uh, we see that this formula, this matrix has a very specific form. This is a, a very specific type of matrices, if you just forget about these coefficients. So this is a, uh, so I, I'll write transpose of this matrix here. So C prime, so determinant, is um, C2 hat, C3 hat, C m plus 1 hat. Then goes this one goes here, C3 hat, C4 hat. Then this one goes one higher, m plus 2. Then this goes duh, 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 until C m plus 1 hat. Then here 1 more C M plus two head. So the question is, what is this one? What is this one? This is to check if you are still present. What is this coefficient here? Two M. Good. So this is two M. The condition is this is equal to zero. So you see, by the way, this determinant has a very specific form. What is, the, what, what, what is this? Um, to be honest, I'm always confused because there are two types of matrices. So one is Henkel matrix and another is Teplitz. So one of these is Henkel and one is Teplitz. I mean, if you forget these coefficients, then this one is of uh, one type and this one is another type. This is Henkel. That's correct, yes. So this one is Henkel, and this one is uh, Teplitz. So how can, we, how can we memorize this? No way, I think. So, uh, so this, this one is Teplitz. I think that we should say the Teplitz is more important. And then if we remember the Teplitz is more important, then on the main diagonal is constant. This is somehow, I don't know other way to, to memorize this. Okay, uh, so what? Mm -hmm. So, the, so this is uh, this is a te uh, this is a, so th this one is Teplitz and this one is Henkel. For this particular problem, I think it's uh, so. This is in a sense a challenge. Is there a, a way somehow to explore? Uh, in a more um, elaborate way, why is this uh, form appearing here and so on? 
Okay, there was a question a few days ago about some polynomials entering into this game. There was a question, okay, uh, probably the answer was not satisfactory, so person is not here, never mind. Then uh, let me just uh, uh, say, um, so you see, now uh, when we, we are looking for a specific C1 to Cn, that this function f, what we get at uh, some point, has uh, zero of order n. So plug, instead of f1 and fn, the functions we have here. These are some uh, polynomials in x, or y times polynomial in x. So when we do this here, we will get polynomial in x plus y time polynomial in x. Y, uh, so y is square root of this polynomial. And what we want is, in a sense, we are looking for a solution which has a good approximation in certain point. So th this is the connection. And this is how these polynomials enter into the game. So here we really get very specific poly polynomials. OK. Now, uh, let me, uh, so, now, so this is for n equal to n plus 1. And now I can also, just for the reference, I should write this also for n equal to m. So in particular, we see that for n, let me see, for n equal, n equal 3, So example, for n equal 3, m is equal 1, what we are getting, so m equal 1, we should put here m equal 1, we are getting c2. So all the, what we get, this is c2 equal 0. For n equal 4, this is m equal Two, we should put here m equal two. We get uh, three, so we are getting c three equal zero. And for n equal five, this is m equal two. We are getting c two c four minus c three square equal zero. So this is. So I can. Uh, formulate an exercise to uh, exercise is to you remember we had this uh, curve yesterday um, and the point P 3 8 so can you somehow apply this machinery for this, for this particular case. So this is an exercise. This is an exercise, and with this we uh, somehow derived everything we needed in this uh, section two, and still we have some time to, I think, go to uh, 
section 4. Okay, are there any questions so far? Yes. Ah, this is, a, I, I, no, no, this is going to be exercised next time. I need to, so we still didn't uh, come to, uh, we need to yeah, sorry, connect yeah. this with, uh, we derived machinery, but we still didn't, uh, so this is, this is exercise, yes. Not to derive Fuchs, but at least to compare, Fuchs, uh, to, to compare. Okay. So now we need to, uh, uh, answering to, to Sergei's question, now we need to see why do we need all of this? Why did we use all this? Okay, have you uh, copied these formulas and everything? Can may I erase? Okay. So that, that is the point I plan, I plan to reach on the previous uh, lesson. So this is a sort of um, this um, compatibility of our plans and our uh, capability to realize the plans. So now we are going to introduce one configuration. Th this presentation now on follows uh, closely a very nice paper of Griffiths and Harris of um, uh, um, 27 years ago or something. I think it's 77 or 78. Uh, so, so, so we are now looking this uh, sort of configuration. So given two conics, B and C2, we are looking, uh, so uh, let me at least uh, say once again, so uh, we are thinking about now Poncelet, so we are thinking about uh, two conics, B and C2, and we, are, we want to code this situation where we have this tangent, tangents to C2 which intersect at B. So tangents to C2 belong to dual of C2, C2 star. So Griffiths and Harry suggest to consider this configuration, configuration of lines and points such that line belongs to C2 star, point belongs to B, and there is one more condition that Q, Q belongs to L. So this is a sort of a configuration And uh, as, uh, not, not exactly, but similarly to what was uh, mentioned today by, uh, by Sergei, here we have two natural, here we have two natural involutions. Here in, the, in this set, we have two natural involutions. One involution is, so given L, if this is L, there is Q1 and Q2. There are two points on B with one L, and with one Q1, there are two L, L1 and L2, which pass to this Q1. So, there are two involutions associated with this set. Given line, there are two points. Given a point, there are two tangents.
So the first involution, I denoted it as C2 star of L and Q is L prime Q, meaning that um, L prime is another tangent to C2 through Q. And there is I B of L Q. This is L Q prime, meaning that Q prime is another point of intersection of L and B. And then uh, what, what we, how can we uh, look at this billiard dynamics? We can say, uh, oh no, sorry, this Poncele, Poncele, this uh, Poncele configuration, this Poncele configuration arises as uh, alternative uh, usage of these involutions. So what are we doing? We are starting from a point and a tangent. Then we keep the tangent and switch the point. So this is a new point with the first tangent. Then we keep the point but switch the tangent. Then we again keep the tangent and switch the point. Then we keep the point and switch the tangent and so on. So this is how it goes. So in uh, this row of P or rho of uh, C2 star B is composition of these two involutions. This is what it is. Now, um, for example, for example, let me let me think. Uh, so, um, uh, so we can. Um, so, what are the fixed points? So, let's think. What are the fixed points of this? What are the fixed points of these involutions? What are the fixed points? So, for example, of the first one. When do we have a situation that in a given point we have only one tangent to that we have only one tangent to C2? So, so the fixed points of the first involution are those correspond to those where, to, to those Q where we have only one tangent. So where are those where we have only one tangent? We don't see them on this picture. This picture is misleading because it's uh, too, too real, too realistic. We need to have something more complex. Actually, it looks like this. It always looks like this. So now, if this is B and this is C2, so we have these intersection points.
Mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell a joke, but uh, still we cannot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there are these, uh, there are these um, uh, uh, four tangents, and these four tangents are, uh, uh, let's say, L1, L1, L2, L3, L4. These are fixed points of the involution IB. So actually, we don't know what this P exactly is, but we see that it can be seen as a double cover, for example, over B with four uh, ramification points, or it can be seen as a double cover over C2 uh, with four uh, ramification points, depending uh, which of these two involutions you choose. Uh, on the other hand, we know that conic is a rational curve, so this is a CP1. So we have a double cover over CP1 with four ramification points this way or another way. And using the principle I tried to convey to you at the beginning, so this is uh, like, you know, this, uh, if it, uh, how it goes. If it sounds like a duck, if it uh, moves like a duck, and if it, I don't know what else, like a duck, then it's a duck, so since that is duck, this is elliptic curve. So using this principle, we actually proved, or scientifically speaking, applying uh, riemann hurwitz formula, we immediately see that uh, P uh, C2 star B is an elliptic. So let's, let's put like this, applying riemann hurwitz, hurwitz formula, we get that P of C two star B is an elliptic curve. And we know, of course, that elliptic curves have uh, different appearances. If they appear as a cubics, then uh, involutions which have fixed points can be described by the following, uh, actually I mentioned this last time, so we can take two points, um, let's say T1 and T2, and we can define involution from last time, tau T1, as tau T1 of x is uh, T1 circle x, and we can define involution similarly, tau T2 of x is T2 x. So this picture of having dynamics induced by two involutions in this screen can be seen in the following way. So we are applying two involutions all the time. We are starting from some point x. So tau t1 of x is this point here. Then we apply tau of t2. We are getting some point somewhere here. Then we are applying, again, the first one. We are going here. Then we, from here, uh, applying this one. And we are going somewhere. Hmm. Uh, we are going somewhere here, and so on. So this is a way how we can see uh, dynamics generated by two involutions. So I will just finish with the with the following, of course, if we are looking at an elliptic curve as we did in this sense of a torus uh, in this fundamental parallelogram, that uh, I will leave this as an exercise that, um, so we are considering elliptic curve as a factor of a, a, a complex line by, by, by a lattice. Then um, there are two types of involution. So if, if tau is an involution with a fixed point, then tau of z is minus z plus b. This is the form. And if tau is an involution 
without fixed points, then, so I will leave this as an exercise. What is if, so if tau is an evolution with, with fixed points, then this is necessarily of the form in this presentation, tau of z equal minus z plus b. However, there are involutions without fixed points, and they have a little bit different presentation. So here we have um, involutions. Here we have involutions with fixed points. So in this presentation, we can say that the first one, I B of z is minus z plus b, and I C two star of z is minus z plus C two. Then rho we are looking for of Poncelet, which is um, of z, which is composition of these two involutions. Is nothing but z plus c2 minus b, if I'm not mistaken in the calculation. So that means that this billiard dynamics in, in, in this picture is going to be nothing but a shift for this element c2 minus b, denoted as a p. And this shift doesn't depend on the choice of the point. So that means if we want to have this Poncelet configuration to be periodic with a, and to starting from some point close after n steps, that means that, that, means that uh, at that point we conclude that np is equal to zero. And then since np equals zero, if we apply this to any other point, we, uh, we conclude that rho n of p is going to be identically equal, uh, not zero, it should be say identity probably, identity. So we are coming to this condition, np equals zero on an elliptic curve, and just uh, 15 minutes ago, we derived a machinery how to investigate if a given point is satisfying this condition or not. But to do that, to do that, we need one more step. This is to pass from given two matrices to a cubic curve, to curve of the form y squared equal a polynomial of third degree in x. And uh, this, uh, this curve is y squared equal polynomial of third degree, let's say, in t, where this polynomial of third degree of t is determinant of t b plus c2. So this would close the loop once we show, once we show that this elliptic curve is isomorphic to that elliptic curve. So in order to show that, as I told you how we compare two elliptic curves, we compare them as ramified uh, coverings. And we have these four points over which they, they, uh, they are ramified. If this cross ratio coincide, then these two curves are isomorphic. Next time, we will show even a simpler thing. We will show that actually we can we can uh, realize this curve as branch over exactly the same points as P was. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>